So uh, this afternoon, we're going to talk more about the performance-related topics of uh, CUDA programming. And so, you know, as I mentioned this morning, let me make sure I've got we're in the right spot. Yeah. So as I mentioned this morning, you know, uh, GPUs are very good at doing arithmetic. We don't need to be counting flops or worrying about how much arithmetic we're doing. Our major consideration for getting good performance out of GPUs uh, centers on uh, putting our operands in the right memory system and accessing those uh, memory uh, locations in the most appropriate way for the hardware of the GPU. Um, you know, generally speaking, again, we have so much arithmetic performance that in a typical case, if you haven't done some special work, you'll probably end up being memory bandwidth bound. So we want to keep our data in the machine registers, that's the local variables, as, as long as possible or as many iterations as possible. Uh, and we want to choose our memory systems uh, very carefully. So when I was describing how GPU work is scheduled on the GPU, I, I told you that things are decomposed into thread blocks and so on. I think we have a little PowerPoint oops here on my diagram of the thread block, but that's all right. Um, these uh, thread blocks are decomposed into warps, and a warp is basically a software representation of uh, the way that the GPU SM actually ex executes these threads. So uh, different GPU generations of, have the minutia of how these threads get executed maybe isn't that important, but you can consider them to be groupings of 32 threads at a time in practice. And they basically execute in lockstep a lot like the way a CPU vector uh, unit would execute things, except that we have this multi-threading so that multiple of these warps can be juggled at a time on a single SM. So we have a thread block consisting of at least one more, hopefully a bunch of warps. So that's why we use a thread block that has, say, 64 or 256 threads. It's going to have a bunch of warps in it. And when a warp tries to access memory and it stalls, the uh, instruction scheduler will basically go and find some other thread to run which has its operands ready. Uh, an interesting is issue that uh, occurs with this sort of lockstep execution is that if uh, any of these uh, threads takes a branch a different way than the others, it is going, the hardware has to ex execute both the if part of the branch and the then part of the, the branch. And it will have to do both sides. So that means that whichever threads took the if half, they do that half. Whichever half, uh, whichever threads took the then half, have to execute their half. If you're lucky and all the threads take the same branch the same way, then they remain sort of uh, coherent and you don't have to do this. So the hardware detects when these uh, uh, div divergence occurs and it will have to do both sides of the branch and you lose performance. So it's what that means to you when you're scheduling work and when you're deciding how to decompose your, your work index space, if you can uh, organize your work such that neighboring threads tend to fall through these branch statements in the same way, that will pr promote better performance because you'll avoid this divergence where the hardware has to execute both sides of the branch. So uh, I talked a little bit about this before, but you can never repeat it enough. So I'll just give an example. So for the old Kepler K40 hardware, we were able to do about uh, 4.3 teraflops of single precision arithmetic. And uh, that was on a piece of hardware that only had uh, about 288 gigabytes per second. That's about 60 floating point operations per memory reference if you were just going through an array of, uh, you know, very large array in memory, that tells you have a sort of a 60 to 1 ratio of flops to memory bandwidth. So you need to find some way to reuse your operands. If you're, if you're not able to reuse them or you're not able to put them in a fast memory uh, location, then you're going to be bound not by the performance of 4.3 teraflops, but you'd be bound by the 280 gigabyte per second memory bandwidth limit. So what you want is the higher number on the left, but what you might be stuck with, depending on either the algorithm that you're implementing or the size of your data, you might be stuck with the memory bandwidth. So <clears throat> to get that 200, even to get 288 gigabytes per second, you have to read memory in a particular way. And th that way is essentially with neighboring threads reading consecutive elements in memory. So in other words, if I'm thread zero and uh, thread one is next to me, 
when I go fetch something from memory, thread one should be fetching something right next to the thing that I'm fetching. So they are in sort of consecutive memory locations. So that's true if they're a single precision quantity, a double precision quantity, etc. <clears throat> the GPU memory controllers do have some flexibility. So uh, for example, you can have a coalesced access, whether it's an int, a float, a double. They also have some special types that are a compound type or a, like a struct, uh, like they have what's called a float four. It's a small uh, four element vector. And so you can also have them read a float four in neighboring consecutive indices, right? And so as long as you meet that requirement, you will approach that peak performance, that peak memory bandwidth. Uh, so there are some small details, but that gets you, say, 90% of the way there. And the rest is just avoiding um, some other little details that, you know, that would slow your code down. So <clears throat> again, uh, if this is not the case, so let's uh, explain, you know, what, what is, so that's what coalesced memory accesses are. An uncoalesced memory access is any case where you violate that rule. So let's say I'm thread number zero and I access uh, memory element zero. If thread number one goes off and accesses uh, memory element 30,000, okay, well that's uncoalesced. That's a memory transaction uh, that requires more than one hardware cycle to, to resolve. So if they were next to each other, the memory system would fetch one big block of memory and the threads would pull their operands from their memory and life would be good. Now there are other, the, the GPU can actually handle various other patterns. If you go look at the CUDA programming guide after I'm done speaking, you can see that actually so long as the threads within a warp access elements that are within uh, the same chunk of memory, uh, the hardware has a so-called broadcast feature so that it, if multiple threads read the same element, that is uh, with no penalty. Um, if multiple threads uh, have a funny staggered pattern, this is, this is still okay. But what you, what you don't want are many things uh, reading from sort of uh, randomized memory uh, addresses. Those, those are not going to work well. And so those would, would, was, would result in several memory transfer operations being done at the hard, hardware level. So when we talk about what is coalesced and what is not coalesced, coalesced is just a shorthand term to mean that we're, we're doing our memory reads or writes in the minimum number of hardware cycles. And um, the details I was describing, as long as the threads in a warp read from a contiguous region that's 32 items of four, eight, or 16 bytes in size, that would give you uh, coalesced access. That's a simple way of thinking about it. <clears throat> to get near the peak performance, you want them to read the larger sizes. So if you want to hit the, let's say, 99% of the theoretical peak memory bandwidth, you have to have each of those threads reading 16 byte quantities, not the four byte quantities. The four byte quantities might get you 80% of performance, but to get the full performance, you want the larger payload size. So that's why you might want to use some of these special types like float two, float four, double, double two, et cetera. <clears throat> Let's see. And, uh, Writes are sort of the same as reads, but of course you can't really deal with uh, writes to the same location. So you have a write conflict, and one of the threads will win, but this is a race condition. So you have undefined behavior, so my advice is don't do that. <laughs> um, so that means you, you, this is again where that advice about scatter versus gather comes from. Scatter can cause conflicts, gather avoids conflicts. Um, so another issue is, because we want our memory uh, accesses to remain in this sort of aligned fashion, we get the absolute peak performance when everything is an even multiple of these uh, 32 times whatever access size. This is an interesting thing to observe when you decompose your work. Uh, another reason to uh, choose to pad your arrays would be to ensure uh, an aligned and uh, tiled memory access that's essentially perfect. Mm -hmm. On modern GPUs, this is much less important than it used to be. With the older GPUs, you actually suffered a penalty if you started to have a, an unaligned access, you know, even though they were sequential or consecutive in memory, if they didn't begin on a, a boundary of 32 times one of those sizes, you would lose a little performance. With state-of-the-art GPUs, they have a smarter memory controller. They can deal with a lot of cases the older GPUs couldn't deal with. But <coughs> there is a tiny little uh, performance gain if you have, happen to have things exactly a multiple of 32. 
Um, so something to keep in mind about GPU performance. Um, GPUs do their best work when they're really just crunching through doing these flops and memory loads and stores with a regular access pattern. That's when they, it, things are the easiest for a GPU to be productive. And so some of the things you might consider are uh, in, in the real world with real code, we often have exceptions. We have uh, work units. Maybe not every work unit is created equal. Maybe some require some kind of special handling. If you can do some sort of um, you know, pre-processing or sorting or uh, characterization of what the work units going in are going to be, you might be, be able to uh, a priori identify troublesome work units. Like if, uh, if 10 million work units are all the same, but three require some special handling that uh, maybe runs a different path, a totally different code path, that would be a great example of a case where send the exceptional work units to the CPU because the CPU is actually very good at dealing with uh, sort of branchy, unpredictable, uh, you know, scatterbrained code. CPUs are great at running really uh, messy code, but GPUs are not. GPUs don't like that. GPUs don't have uh, fancy branch prediction hardware. They don't have out of order execution. They are trying to keep things simple. And so if you can regularize the work that the GPU uses, and that it does and use sort of fixed sized uh, predictable data structures, things like this, GPUs will get their very near their hardware peak performance. When you get irregular work on a GPU, you're decreasing its efficiency of its execution because it has these warp sized chunks and, and the way they handle divergent branches and all that. And uh, more importantly, uh, the memory access pattern. So it's most important to get the memory access patterns right, and then things like branch divergence are, are sort of a second level consideration. Um, so let's see, we're back to somehow what happened here. Yes, I don't know what just happened. All right. So um, next question is uh, GPU occupancy, right? So how do you know how effectively you're utilizing the GPU? So if you think in terms of um, you know, the mapping of the work to the GPU, uh, we have this term we call occupancy. That's basically taking a certain number of these uh, threads and putting them on the GPU, depending on how much resources each of those thread requires. So this gets into a funny issue about GPUs. GPUs don't have, they have this big pool of registers, but those registers are actually shared among different hardware units. So that means unlike a CPU where we have a fixed set of registers uh, and that number might be four in the case of an old school uh, ancient x86 chip or uh, maybe in the case of a state of the art x86 we have maybe 32 or something like this and they're vectors. Um, on the GPU we have a variable sort of a variable size pool of registers per thread and if we use more registers per thread that limits the number of threads that can be running actually on the hardware at any given moment. There's sort of a fixed size number of slots and resources. So if each thread uses more resources, that means I can only co-schedule a reduced number of threads. Uh, similar, another way of saying it is if I use fewer threads or fewer registers per thread, I can get more threads running at once on the GPU. And, th and that term, occupancy, is basically referring to how many threads are actually sitting on the hardware at any given moment. And that measurement occupancy is sort of a, it's a placeholder for having some idea of how much tolerance the GPU might have for latency, for global memory reads and writes. So the more threads you have on the GPU, the more opportunity it has to hide memory latency for reads and writes. So higher occupancy is many times but not always an indicator that you have good latency hiding or that you may have good latency hiding. So the only way to really know how well your latency hiding and things are working is to use a profiling tool and actually measure it, okay? But this is something you can type some numbers into a spreadsheet and predict what kind of occupancy you will achieve. There's a, a little spreadsheet out there called a CUDA GPU occupancy calculator and if you tell it what GPU you're using, it's got a little drop down box. You can say, I'm using, a, I have written a kernel that uses this many registers and I want a block size of this and a grid size of that. And it'll, it'll predict what GPU occupancy you're achieving. Do I have 50% occupancy versus what the hardware could hold or do I have 70% uh, 
Higher is usually, but not always better. Sometimes it's, it's, you can actually have a kernel that has low occupancy and uses a huge amount of registers. And if that kernel needs fewer global memory reads or writes, it might actually run faster than another one uh, that uses uh, far fewer registers and has higher occupancy. So just be aware of that trade-off. It's just a latency hiding uh, metric, you might say. So how do GPUs access memory? Uh, you know, how do you get your data in, on and off the GPU? So um, you can actually have GPUs access host memory. There's a, a feature called zero copy or uh, host mapped memory access. So basically a GPU, aside from using CUDA mem copy or CUDA mem copy as sync, you can take a memory buffer that's on the CPU already that you've already allocated and you can tell CUDA that it's out there and that you want to basically make that memory buffer, buffer readable and writable by the GPU. And what's interesting about this is if you have a, and, and this is the, the guidance I'll give you, keep in mind this is coming over whatever bus you're using. So if it's PCI Express, 12 gigabytes a second, right? If you have a terabyte per second memory band within the onboard GPU memory, you may not want to be putting much uh, back and forth to the host. But if it's a very small amount of data that's being transferred, like a completion status or some, let's say you did a reduction of 10 million elements on the GPU and the number, the answer was five, you can actually have the kernel write that result directly to the host without having to do a separate CUDA mem copy. And for very small transfers, this can actually be a win. So uh, to give you an example, if I use CUDA mem copy, to copy one byte to the GPU. It takes about three microseconds, give or take. Um, and uh, for, uh, for every call, no matter how small the payload is, I'm incurring that sort of overhead, right? So you should, when you write your code, when you see that you're doing a memory copy, you can just predict right there, say bye-bye to a couple of microseconds. Some, a microsecond or two of time just went out the window. So if you can avoid doing that extra operation, and instead have that kernel write it directly, you've saved a microsecond right there. It doesn't sound like a lot of time, but for a GPU, a GPU can do a heck of a lot of math in that microsecond. And because the GPU is using its existing multi-threading hardware to hide latencies, not only is it able to hide latencies for things like um, you know, reading and writing its own memory, it is also able to hide latencies writing to the host memory uh, through this uh, zero copy mechanism. So host mapped memory, uh, you can either do it the old fashioned way is with CUDA host alloc. Uh, the, old, the older GPUs, this was the only way uh, you could do it with the older versions of CUDA. Uh, the newer GPUs and the newer versions of CUDA and especially if you're using uh, the managed memory, this is sort of more automatic and so you don't have to do this uh, by hand. So one of the things that's gotten better with the recent versions of CUDA, and recent being in the last five years, so this has been around a while now, uh, which is all the GPUs now have unified virtual addresses. So that means every GPU has a non-overlapping memory address space. And so if you allocate memory on one GPU, you allocate memory on another GPU, you can transfer data direct from one GPU to another, and the driver will automatically figure out the best way to do this, whether it's over PCI Express or NVLink and so on. Um, another thing this allows you to do, because they have a unique uh, virtual address space, uh, when you combine CUDA with MPI, uh, if you use a so-called GPU direct enabled implementation of MPI, you can send messages that come from one GPU's memory, send a message over InfiniBand or, or whatever uh, interconnect you're using, and have an MPI receive on the other end that receives it into another GPU's memory. And if you have the right hardware and software stack on the computer you're using, this will completely bypass going through the host CPU. And you might say, well, why do I need to, why is that important? And the reason is, if you had to first copy it from the GPU to the host, and then use MPI send on the host, you effectively have gone over that PCI Express channel twice. So you've, you've cut your bandwidth or your, uh, in half and you've had to do two transactions. So if you exploit this feature in, of GPU Direct, you can uh, send and receive messages straight into and out of the GPU memory going right to the InfiniBand or whatever other 
network adapter, and that'll uh, double your effective throughput. So that's a great technique. So uh, another thing to be aware of is when you copy memory back and forth between the host, um, this is something, you know, on a CPU code you're completely unaware of in most cases. But uh, when you get into devices like GPUs that are transferring data very near the peak bandwidth of the hardware, this starts to matter. So um, the CPU has what we call virtual memory pages, okay? These pages are usually four kilobytes in size. They can be made larger. Uh, you can make large pages that are megabytes in size. But the point is when you want to transfer uh, data to a piece of hardware like a disk controller or a network card or in this case a GPU, one of the things that has to happen is you program a so-called DMA engine, a, a copy engine. This copy engine is separate from the CPU and you, set, you tell it, hey, I want you to copy this data from this memory to that piece of hardware and that will alleviate the CPU from having to be involved in, in this copy and so you have some uh, task parallel computing going on there. And the problem with this is while that copy is going on, if you guys are familiar with how virtual memory on a CPU works, if you run out of memory it starts uh, paging and paging is basically taking pages of memory and copying them to the hard drive or pulling them back and that's how your computer deals with running out of memory. So you've Probably at some point in your life, being uh, technical computing people, at some point you probably ran a computer low on memory and it started ch chugging and getting very slow. <coughs> and when that happens, that's what's going on. It's, it's copying memory back and forth to disk. So the problem is if you're copying that memory to a GPU, if you've invoked a copy, you can't have this kind of memory pages being, uh, you can't have them being moved simultaneously or being taken out from under the DMA controller. So one of the things that happens is the driver has to lock that memory page and say you can't move this. This is fixed. It's staying here uh, until further notice. When you do a CUDA mem copy with no special setup, this is on normal host memory. If you haven't allocated it specially, it is not pinned, okay? And so what that means is at the time you do the CUDA copy, the driver is having to interact with the operating system kernel and say, hey, can you pin this 4K page of memory? Thanks, great, now I copy that to the, the GPU. Oh, hey, can you, pay, can you pin this next 4K page of memory? Or it, it has to basically do this as it's copying all the data. It's having to pin and unpin all these pages of memory or do various other tricks in the driver. And as you can imagine, doing this on a very fine-grained basis, like a four kilobyte memory page, involves a huge amount of overhead, right? So we don't want it to do that. So the way you get around this is, there is a way to allocate memory on the host and tell the operating system, I don't want you to move any of this memory. Not that page, not this page, not the other page, but none of it. I want all of it to be pinned for all time. And so if you're using something like CUDA then, if it's marked as pinned already, then the driver and the CUDA runtime know this a priori, and this bypasses this uh, overhead of having to manually pin and unpin pages while the copy's going on. And so the practical difference that this makes is, uh, rather than getting PCI bandwidth of some fraction, you might be limited down to around two or three gigabytes a second, uh, is, is the best you can do with some unpinned memory you might get closer to 12, uh, which is what the hardware is actually able to do. So just as an example, here are different uh, memory copy performances with different payload sizes. You also observe with small payloads, there's the setup time to program the DMA controllers and make the PCI bus ready and do all these things. It takes a few transactions. It's, not, it's a non-zero time just like what you saw with the performance of libraries when you have a small uh, work size the overhead dominates and so our effective throughput uh, our effective transfer rates at small small copy sizes are a disaster right and so this is this is where you would want to use something like host mapped memory and zero copy access and have the gpu directly read and write something rather than using a CUDA mem copy because the time it takes to launch the mem copy is way longer than the copy itself or the, the payload that you're actually moving. So as you look at the right hand side, once you get to uh, say large size transfers that are say one megabyte is about what it took 
This is a several year old slide, it's from 2014, but back in 2014, we'd have to transfer about a megabyte to maximize the throughput on uh, memory copies. So from that point on, you've uh, basically peaked it out. And what's noteworthy is just the uh, difference between different types of copies, GPU to GPU via MPI, peer GPUs. So this is, if you tell uh, the CUDA runtime that you want to be able to transfer memory between GPUs, uh, the driver can do this for you. Uh, NVIDIA has very smart drivers that are able to, in some cases, pipeline those transfers. Um, and so then you get a higher fraction of the, the peak bandwidth. And you can see that if you do it right with pinned memory buffers, the, the sort of device to host and host to device, they really do hit 12 gigabytes a second. So you can do that. So uh, since we had questions about it this morning, I swapped in. This is why I updated the slides for you guys. I decided to drop in a couple of slides that show the NVLink topology on the uh, Livermore Sierra machine and the Oak Ridge Summit machine. So I described this in the morning, but in case uh, people didn't, uh, in case, I think I also may have misstated some of the numbers. Uh, in the morning, I think I said that uh, Sierra was 200, it's actually 150. And I think I said Summit was 150, it's actually 100. So that's, you can see the topology of the NVLink channels between the Power9 CPUs and the Tesla Volta uh, cards. So on Sierra on the left, you've got three links per card, so that's where you get the 150. There are 50 gigabytes per second each link. On Summit, you've got two links per card, and so that's how that works out. So this is what a uh, compute node from Summit looks like. It's a super dense uh, node configuration, so you've got one uh, machine that's got two CPU sockets, six GPUs. It's got uh, two triangles of, of three GPUs connected to each socket. And so uh, this interconnectedness allows you to get much higher uh, inner GPU uh, bandwidths than you would have with a typical Intel machine. If you look at just the way uh, Summit is configured, that's what this looks like in total. <clears throat> so the machine has, uh, each Power9 has these three GPUs. As you can see, they're each interconnected. So they, they're fully connected within one of those little triangular things. Um, but you could say that the node has a weak link, and that is this X bus down here. So the X bus between the two Power9 sockets is the weakest channel that, uh, that's on the, the node. So the way a lot of people use the summit nodes would be to treat this as two MPI rinks. And by doing that, uh, you're effectively avoiding trying to, to cross that 64 gigabyte per second boundary because that's by far the lowest bandwidth of anything that's on the, the chart here. But uh, yeah, so that's basically what it looks like. The two sockets, of course, the, the DRAM is accessible by both CPUs and, and of course the different GPUs can talk to each other over that X bus, but you'd have to make some special consideration of the fact that that channel is substantially lower bandwidth than the other ones. So um, the fast on-chip uh, memories that we have available to us on the GPU, um, aside from DRAM, we have registers, of course, constant memory. I said that there's this special 64K constant memory, which we can use to store things that every thread in a thread block are going to read at the same time. Shared memory, which can be resized in various uh, alternative configurations. And there's a read-only data cache and texture cache Texture basically does hardware-assisted spatial locality, and as I, I mentioned, it also does some special range clamping type conversion, and it has an 8-bit precision interpolation. Uh, the read-only data cache is basically a linear representation of memory. Uh, why would you use read-only versus texture cache? Texture cache, because it has that spatial locality, there is some setup time involved. When you send your data into the texture cache to be uh, accessed through this hardware, the GPU runtime system basically re it swizzles your data around in the way that it's required uh, for that special hardware unit. So if, if you're going to do that and use it over and over and over, the texture unit is a great choice. Uh, however, if you're going to be changing that data or it's read-write in many closely knit cycles, you might find that just using the 1D, tech, uh, 1D cache is uh, the preferable way. And so that's what those look like. Um, you, we've already kind of gone through this. So there's nothing new on this figure. Uh, let's see. So 
The shared memory that I mentioned before, this is within an SM. And so that's this, uh, if I go back here, the shared memory is uh, this little region up here. And like I said, we, it's uh, 16, 32, or 64K configurable in size. That's only accessible to the threads that are running on the same SM. And, and from the programming model's perspective, that's only accessible to the threads within the same thread block. So this is one of the things about the CUDA programming model. Why do we have this uh, breaking things up into blocks? It's because these blocks have a direct mapping to this uh, SM hardware, and that allows you to exploit the fact that they are, are known to be running in the same place, so you know which threads can share memory through share, that shared memory space, and that allows them to do things like synchronize. So generally speaking in CUDA, you, you cannot synchronize different thread blocks. They, in general, they cannot talk to each other. There's an exception, which, which is through atomic memory operations, which I'll get into maybe later. But other than that, they run independently of each other for the course of one kernel launch, right? So they, they and that's the kernel launch boundary is the only other time when you know that all the threads from all the blocks have reached uh, completion status, right? So that's basically how that works. Any questions about this so far? Is any of this confusing? Yes? There's a generic question when you get through this. Yeah? Okay. So communication between threads in the same block. So this is what one of the, an example of something we can do with the shared memory is we can do reductions. We could have every thread in a thread block write a value to a shared memory. I've shown the, uh, an example. Let's pretend all these little blue squares are threads. If they each write a result or some, you know, their contribution to some reduction operation, they write their results into shared memory. Then we can use a recursive doubling type algorithm and uh, do a parallel reduction in a logarithmic number of steps and get the reduced value finally in one uh, element at the end of the reduction. And this is done using um, a series of uh, barrier synchronizations and, and or barrier synchronizations and memory fences to ensure that uh, the, date, the changes to that shared memory are visible to the other set threads in the same uh, block. And uh, again, we can use atomic memory operations to global memory as a way of communicating between thread blocks. So, uh, in practice, what that might mean, if you wanted to do a parallel reduction, you could do this within a thread block, and then the zero thread of the entire thread block could take that final reduced result for the thread block and use an atomic operation to contribute that, an atomic uh, add, for example, to add something into a global sum that all the thread blocks are contributing to, just as an example. Um, another consideration for GPUs, uh, because of this strided global memory access pattern that I described in the beginning, one of the common things that we end up wanting to change about CPU code, if you've done a good job and you've written your object-oriented CPU code, you probably have data structures that uh, look like what you see on the left. That's called array of structures. So you might have an array of uh, some vector type or something like this that has X, Y, Z. Uh, that works great on a CPU. On a GPU, in the more general case, that doesn't work so great. And the reason is you end up with uh, many threads hitting the same memory bank. I mean, the GPU will run code that accesses a structure like this. It will run, but it won't run at full performance. And it's because we have this big fan of threads, and we want them all to read from a different memory controller. Not only does the GPU have a bunch of uh, parallel arithmetic units, it actually has multiple memory controllers and multiple memory controller channels. And so the way the hardware works, it distributes all these reads and writes across all these channels. If you have something that's a multiple of three, guess what happens? A bunch of the threads map onto the same memory controllers and you have uh, a slower performance. If it happens to be now in, in this particular case, because it is a small struct, if that had been 16 bytes, if I had added one more float and I just called it trash or padding or whatever, I could have made that performant because that happens to be small enough that the GPU hardware actually can do something that's got four floats in it. But, it, but I'm just, as I'm saying, in the general case, that's not the way you would want to do it. 
To make it easy to write your GPU code, you can use a so-called structure of arrays. So you sort of invert the structure. Instead of having an array of those little vectors, you now have a structure that has those vectors split out into separate XYZ arrays. That makes it a lot easier to guarantee a, a trivially fast memory access pattern for the GPU. <clears throat> now GPUs, because you have shared memory, another trick they can do is sometimes you can have them read from something like that on the left and produce something like this on the right as part of what they're doing. You can you know, build that into your kernel and have them reformatting the data from some input format into some intermediate representation sort of on the fly. So that's something you can keep in mind. <clears throat> GPUs have atomic memory operations. This basically means that even though we have a multi-threaded piece of hardware, the memory controllers are integrated with some special arithmetic units in such a way that all of the threads can participate in updating a shared counter or a shared uh, floating point uh, accumulator. And because we have special atomic memory operations, they can fire off an increment or a decrement operation on one of those uh, special shared counters or accumulators. And the memory system will interact with those and ensure that you get the correct result regardless what order they're uh, added to. One thing to watch out for is that although <coughs> CUDA provides atomic memory operations for floating point numbers, remember that floating point arithmetic is not associative. So if you add, if you say A equals B plus C, that is not exactly the same answer as uh, A equals C plus B. So you change that order a little bit, you'll get a slightly different answer. So that's something to be aware of if you're going to use floating point atomic operations. Integers, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, so let's see, another interesting thing. So beginning with the GPUs that are in blue waters and going forward, we have a nice uh, new instruction called shuffle. And shuffle basically allows us to do this kind of parallel reduction in machine registers without actually writing anything to shared memory. And so that's great because it saves shared memory for other things. So we can now use, we can do a, a warp shuffle. So within the 32 threads that are members of the same warp, they can actually read and write each other's register directly using this special operation. And so then I don't even have to write something to shared memory. And why would you do that? Well, two reasons. The shuffle is faster because it's a register. Shared memory is like a, a little, bit, uh, little bit slower memory. It's maybe one eighth or so or one sixth the speed of a register. So whereas shuffle is really doing this stuff out of registers. And uh, because you're leaving that shared memory alone, now you can use it for something else. So it leaves that free and open uh, and available. And so then there are other things. So later versions of CUDA, CUDA, CUDA 9 added a feature called cooperative thread groups. And that gives you other ways of doing things like reductions uh, without having to concern yourself with the minutia of specific warps and things like this. Um, so as I mentioned before, a common programming idiom or pattern that you find in CPU code is scatter type algorithms where they write a bunch of stuff to uh, memory. Uh, with individual threads. Because we have so many threads on the GPUs, we can't afford to privatize everything per thread. And so we have to, often, the better way of doing things is have a bunch of threads reading a shared data structure because you can do that without any conflicts. And that's what we would call more of a gather approach. I have examples of that if people want to understand that in detail, but there's not enough time to get into that uh, in depth today. Um, by using privatization schemes, so if I, let's say I'm trying to compute a histogram, histograms are a great example case of uh, the difficulty of having a large number of parallel contributors updating a shared data structure. <clears throat> I can't afford to have a copy of a histogram on every thread. That's exactly what I would do on a CPU, right? I would have every CPU thread or every MPI rank would have a complete copy of their own private histogram and they could basically uh, run through a loop and update that histogram with impunity without any synchronization with their peers whatsoever. And that would work until you needed the final histogram at the end. Then you'd have to do a, a little reduction to get the single histogram from all the constituent pieces. On a GPU, I can't afford to have a histogram per thread, not unless it's like a four element histogram, right? So uh, if I need a 20,000 element histogram, that's impractical. 
But what I could do, or in many cases I can do, is I could have a histogram that's shared among maybe one warp or one thread block. And by limiting that local histogram to just one thread block, I can then use atomic operations to, to increment things like histogram slots within that thread block, and that will run substantially faster than if I was sharing a single histogram over all the thread blocks because I have localized those memory accesses. I can use shared memory instead of global memory, and I can use, uh, because I've reduced the contention scope, fewer threads are writing to the same bins at the same time than if I did it globally with a, you know, every single thread doing its own uh, atomic update to a, a global memory counter. Um, so yeah, basically the idea of privatization will work on a GPU, but you have to do it on a warp or a thread block level of some kind. And then you can use things like shared memory rather than global memory. So here's an example where we take something um, and avoid output conflicts. So if we wanted to accumulate sub sums in thread local registers, um, you know, rather than writing a bunch of stuff to shared memory first, I can, of course, if every thread does several work units, let's say I, I have some problem and I have to sum a bunch of stuff, I can decide a certain number of threads I'm going to run, and that might be smaller than the total number of work units that I'm doing, right? So one thread is going to do several items, and it's just going to increment something in its own local register. At some point, I could either uh, have every thread then go and add to single accumulator, or I can do you know, your trivial parallel reduction like this, whether it was done with shuffle or shared memory or otherwise. There are some other ways of doing those things where you can uh, have a warp, collectively sum things in a loop first, and then you can have the loop, the, the warp do a reduction, and you know, do uh, blockwise reductions after that. There are a bunch of different schemes. Okay, so uh, at this point I'd say, you know, again, I'm, I'm happy to take questions and pause for a little bit before we go on to the next piece. I, I think the questions have been asked have been answered, but if someone doesn't have an answer to one of their questions, repost it, please. Yeah, I'm very happy to answer any questions on what we've talked about so far. The next thing is uh, simpler stuff. So if there's any questions about the details of CUDA, let's have it now. Yes, Scott? What's the reference for the gather version of scatter? So um, I can give them some of our papers. So for example, um, what would be a great example there, uh, scatter versus gather? Like one of the earliest papers we wrote about uh, calculating electrostatic fields. You know, if you uh, calculate an electrostatic field in parallel on a CPU, uh, in our case, we do a lot of molecular simulations. We want to compute an electrostatic grid. If we wanted to do, I'll give you a trivial algorithm. If I am taking the ele electric charge on a given atom, I can compute its contribution to the electric field at a point in space, I can compute its electrostatic potential by the distance from that atom to that point in space, and I divide its charge and you know some scaling factors, and I add that to that grid point. So on a CPU, a multi-threaded CPU doing this trivial algorithm, I would have a loop over all the atoms, and then for each atom, I would basically loop over the grid points in space and say I'm adding this charge to all these little grid points. That's a very easy way to do it. And if I know that that charge declines towards zero, I might do that within some certain distance, like within a limited range. And so that's a very easy way to give a, uh, an electrostatic field contribution in a certain region in space. I just have the, for each atom, I loop over the nearby grid points, I add that contribution. That's how a CPU does it, it works great, it's very fast. That will not work for a GPU because I, I'm not doing this with one thread, I'm doing this with 100,000 threads. So how do I do it on GPUs? In the GPU case, rather than, write, than adding that sum to neighboring grid points, I do it the opposite way. I build a data structure containing all the atoms, and on the GPU, I, for, I assign a thread for each grid point, that, and instead of uh, writing the, the potentials out to the grid points, those grid points collect the contributions from, from nearby atoms. So it's exactly the inverse scheme. The GP, on the GPU, rather than a thread being an atom like it is on the CPU, the thread is the grid point. 
And the grid point basically says, what atoms are close to me, I'm going to go collect their electrostatic contributions because I can read all of them without a conflict. And that's the way, so by turning the problem inside out, <clears throat> rather than scattering electrostatic contributions to grid points, the GPU collects the electrostatic co contributions to a grid point. So it's just the inverse problem. Yes? What is John's hope that would emerge from the marriage of Mellanox and NVIDIA? I would love to see um, if we go back. So, okay, so I didn't, you know, I, I mentioned this morning there's uh, NVIDIA makes a box called a DGX2. Imagine this summit node, but imagine now that instead of being direct connected, all these GPUs were connected to a switch, right? What my hope would be, my hope would be that NVLink and the InfiniBand fabric somehow get put in a blender, somehow. <laughs> so we'll say NVIDIA throws the GPU and the Mellanox card into a blender, and out comes a, a card that has both NVLink channels and InfiniBand cables on it. <clears throat> and then you would be able to build an unlimited scale machine out of the same component. So. And you know this is, uh, and then you could have uh, as fat of a node as you wanted to build with NVLink with a switch per node, and then between nodes you'd have something that was maybe built on InfiniBand fabric, uh, but you could build an arbitrary scale machine. And of course, the beauty of having all that intermingled, like I said, you put them in a blender. Uh, if you intermingled all that together, then uh, basically the same board would have full knowledge of everything. They would, the GPU would be aware of the InfiniBand topology. The InfiniBand switches would understand what the GPUs are doing or what, what transfers they're doing or what kind of transfer it was. It would, you know, my view is that this isn't going to happen overnight. And of course it's very important that, uh, you know, the vendor is profitable in what they do. They can't just do this for us. They have, you know, HPC is a, is a nice market, but the graveyards of the world are full of companies that built special purpose things just for supercomputers and then they couldn't pay their bills and they ended up going bankrupt. So my advice to NVIDIA, AMD, or anyone who wants to do something like that is find a way to make that work not just for us, but make, it, make that interesting to gamers and cloud vendors and everybody else. I think that uh, my feeling is that you know, with the acquisition of Mellanox, if that ends up going through, NVIDIA has a, an opportunity to do something like that, it, but they'll have to play very carefully with that, uh, keeping that commodity aspect. You know, when I, I started my talk this morning, I pointed out one of the reasons GPUs are successful is they're a commodity. They're not just a highly specialized HPC part, and we can all go to Best Buy and the buy-in for a GPU. You guys could go buy Best Buy right now and buy a GPU that is every bit as programmable as the machine, as the hardware is on Summit. That's pretty awesome. That is an exception to the rule. Most other HPC hardware, you can't afford to even touch it, right? How many of you have personally got an InfiniBand card in any machine you've ever owned? None, right? Exactly. So that's the, the trick is how do you do that and maintain the commodity aspect? I think that's very important. NVIDIA has been very successful in doing that, and I think that's why CUDA succeeded where other accelerators, uh, uh, other accelerators and accelerator strategies have as yet not been successful. So next question. Uh, so this is from Petro. He may have to chime in verbally, but... Each node on Summit has six GPUs and two CPUs. I heard from someone that it's best, performance-wise, to consider one GPU per MPI process instead of multiple GPUs per MPI process. Any general thoughts? It may depend on the code. Um, you know, are they using GPU Direct? This may be a question that has to do with GPU Direct. One thing that is true is that GPUs, um, just like a CPU has a context, it, the operating system manages an active thread or an active context, when multiple things talk to the same GPU, there's some context switching overhead. So if you have one MPI going to three GPUs, maybe there is some small overheads that are involved there. I don't think they're that big, um, but you know that's something that on Summit I haven't been doing 
uh, multiple MPI ranks per node. For my application, uh, I am so memory capacity bound that I run one MPI rank for this entire node and everything inside the node, all of it, I do with threads uh, on multi-core mm -hmm. processors and the topology and pinning of threads and all this stuff I have to deal with myself. So that's the way I do it. I can't confirm or deny that there's anything uh, beneficial or wrong with doing two MPI ranks versus six. I, I am aware that people do both. And, but I think it depends on your application. I would, I would probably have to negotiate what are the details of the application. Well, we'll, we'll probably have a couple minutes left at the end because the next section is pretty short, so I'll go ahead, go ahead and uh, get on to that. So uh, it's sort of an oddball place to have it, but it's at the end, right? So, um, you know, you have a lot of choices available to you. You know, I, as I advised early on, I would say always start with libraries and then move on to something that's directive or you know cheap uh, directive based scheme like OpenACC, see how much of your code you can get on the GPU. It's more important that your code is on the GPU to avoid traversing those slow uh, PCI Express links. You know, if your code is on the GPU, that may be much more important than how fast it's or how, uh, what fraction of the peak performance the GPU is actually getting. In a lot of people's cases, the memory bandwidth uh, limit is as, is as fast as they need it to go. And so, yeah, so I say that here. And, uh, you know, then once, you're, once you are at least to the point that your memory bandwidth bound, <coughs> then the question is, well, I showed you or I at least introduced to you a bunch of performance-oriented uh, concepts, things that are accessible to you in CUDA, that are sort of below the radar of something like OpenACC and CUDA, you have your hands on the nuts and bolts. If you want to put something in a very specific memory area, you can. And you know exactly what size it is, and you know how, which warps are going on it, and you can do things within a warp that, uh, you know, you would never see those things at the level of uh, abstraction that OpenACC provides. But you don't need to do that until you're, you're limited by something, right? So you want to get to the point that you're at least memory bandwidth bound. And then I would say then that question, it's open season. You know, what is it that you want out of it going from there? The other thing you have to consider is that in a lot of people's cases, they can, you know, they can hit some part of their code with a big hammer. Like, we, you know, in molecular dynamics, um, our code, NAMD, in a conventional old school CPU code, 90% of the runtime of uh, molecular dynamics code is, is spent on doing what we call non-bonded electrostatic calculations and, and force calculations. And <coughs> that's one very specific algorithm. So if you looked at a profile of the CPU code, you'd say, aha, I'll move 90% of, of what this code does onto the GPU and I'll declare victory, right? Well, that's true, that's exactly what we did. But what ends up happening is, over a 12-year, 13-year time frame, uh, NVIDIA has doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled the performance of the GPU such that a GPU of today, like you saw, the first GPU I, I wrote CUDA code on had 330 gigaflops of performance, and that was, uh, that was a marketing number. It was very difficult to reach that number. Okay, 330 gigaflops is what we had in 2007 on a GeForce 8800. On a current state-of-the-art Tesla uh, Volta card, you're at 7.5 teraflops. So if you do the math, that's something like 21 times faster. <laughs> you know, it's quite a bit faster than the, than the old hardware. And in certain cases, it's much more than that. Uh, you know, and that doesn't even count things like tensor cores or other special units that the original GPU didn't even have. Uh, so, you know, over time, we move that 90%, we, you declare victory and you say, well, I shouldn't have to move anything for a while. Yeah, but when you get a factor of 21 performance gain, we took that 90% and the GPU crushed it down to practically nothing. So now it's smaller than the remaining 10%. So now we have to take things that were left over in that 10% and move them too. Otherwise, we're subject to Amdahl's law. And eventually you get to some point, you know, most people's code, if you look at a profile, it has a very long tail. Maybe you have a couple of routines that are like 80, 90% of your runtime, fine. You go put them in CUDA or OpenACC, all of a sudden they've been crushed to nothing 
and now you have this long tail of not one routine, not five, you might have 30 smaller routines. And you know, the question you have to ask yourself is, do I really want to write special CUDA kernels for every single one of those, or is it just really that they just can't be on the host anymore because if they are, I have those memory copies creating overhead. By moving those to the GPU, even if they're in quotes slow, that may be good enough. And so that's where uh, I think OpenACC is really critical. So uh, yeah, and so I'm describing this here. So basically, you have other, you know, you have other schemes. You could also try and make your CPU code faster. It doesn't all have to be CUDA and OpenACC. But I think, you know, in, in, in our experience, the GPUs have covered so much uh, performance ground in such a short time. We have basically had to uh, retrench and reconsider our early decisions. We are now having to move basically everything. Everything that's noteworthy is now on the GPU. All, all kinds of stuff. Stuff that used to be 1% of our runtime is now, because it wasn't on the GPU, it's now harming the GPU performance. And so we're having to move that stuff to the GPU too. And so here's a trivial example. Early on we did, uh, this is another one of those uh, electrostatic uh, potential grid calculation codes. This has uh, a couple of different pieces. It has a short range cutoff calculation and that is much like with molecular dynamics, that is one of the large uh, runtime component pieces. Uh, and we thought, oh, I know, we'll just move these two big pieces to the GPU and we'll declare victory, right? And we thought, oh, that'll be fine. And we put those on the GPU, and when the later GPUs came along, they were so much faster <clears throat> that this little piece here, this the little uh, interpolation step, we didn't move that, right? We left that on the host. We thought, ah, oh, three seconds out of, out of uh, something like 533, that'll never be a problem, right? That's what we thought. Wrong. After a couple of generations of GPUs, when Kepler came along, I ran this code, and we got no performance increase from the previous generation Fermi to Kepler. And I thought, ah, oh, this is terrible. How can this be? And of course, guess what it was? It was sitting there bottlenecked on this three second performance uh, thing. Well, you know, we went from 533 seconds down to 20, right? So you can see there was, you know, three is no longer uh, an in insignificant fraction. And this is for the early GPUs. Several generations later, this wasn't even 20 seconds. The whole thing was basically the three seconds that was still on the CPU. So this is what, <clears throat> assuming NVIDIA and the others are successful, this is what's going to happen to you in several generations of hardware. You will make some arbitrary decision and say, I'm putting this stuff on the accelerator and this other thing I'm leaving here. I can tell you right now, that is not going to last for long. If they double the performance a couple of times, you'll be in exactly the same boat that we were. So basically, I would advocate use directives for gradual buy-in. You know, you can incrementally work on your code. It's low cost. It doesn't uh, present much of a challenge. <clears throat> as, it, as I said before, it may be more important that you, that you get the code on the GPU than, the, than that it's even fast. <clears throat> and if your memory bandwidth bound uh, fast enough is not that hard to achieve. So that, and for a lot of people with big array-based codes, that may be all they're after. Um, and so then the other counterexample is why not just use OpenACC? And I would say there are some codes that have particular requirements, like molecular dynamics is really latency sensitive. We have all kinds of uh, tricks that we're able to do with CUDA. CUDA has extensive asynchronous APIs. It's very easy for, uh, for us to maintain very detailed control over what CUDA is doing. And so for us, uh, those are reasons to use CUDA rather than the uh, directives. And you know we're lucky that although Molecular Dynamics has a lot of these leaf node little tiny routines, the majority of what counts we can implement in maybe 20 or 30 CUDA kernels. And it sounds like a lot, but it's over a period of a year, it's not that big of a deal to, to write and maintain those. Um, and of course, you can, you can choose and evolve your code incrementally. You don't have to do it all in CUDA or all in OpenACC. They work with each other. Um, then there are, there are some really cool things. Uh, some of the really advanced features of CUDA that are you know, recently added, like there is a so-called NVIDIA runtime compiler. Actually, somebody asked about it yesterday in the library session. 
um, you can actually generate code on the fly and have the compiler compile something that your application produced. So let's say you're writing some search app that's going to grind through uh, terabytes of data. You've probably heard of uh, databases that have compiled queries. Well, you can, you can use things like JIT to do a compiled kernel or a, comp a special case compiled uh, runtime generated kernel. Uh, to get better performance than any general case could. Or, you know, if the user provides some high degree polynomial, like in quantum chemistry, uh, basis sets are a great example. That's a fundamental parameterization of the science you're doing, but you don't know what it is a priori. But you could write a quantum chemistry code that where the basis set gets inserted into a bigger framework using just in time compilation. And then it's a hard coded part of the code, and that makes it uh, capable of being significantly faster. So those are things that right now, you can do those in CUDA and OpenCL, but the, the JIT is something that isn't available in something like OpenACC, at least not yet. But you know, I think these things will evolve, and over time, uh, some of these technologies will make their way into the higher level uh, abstractions too. And I think uh, with that, I'll just give you an example from VMD. So you know, I work on um, big molecular visualization code, and it has huge amounts of code. It's, it's more like something like Mathematica. So it doesn't just do one thing. It isn't a simulation code. It's used for all kinds of analytical and visualization purposes. So there's no such thing as a, you know, like where we can take the simulation code and run it in a profiler. We can say, well, at least for that kind of simulation, here's what the profile looks like. My code is more of a toolbox. It has 100 tools. It has 1,000 tools. It's really hard to pin down how any one scientist actually uses it. And so there's no such thing as a single profile that represents anything but one very specific task. So I have a lot of routines. And if you look at the interconnectedness of the code, uh, you know, if I diagram various internal modules that are in the number crunching part of the code, you can see that it's not a nice, simple graph. There's a whole bunch of cycles here. There's a bunch of interconnected modules. And it's difficult to pick a point on this and say, oh, yeah, if I write a CUDA kernel for that, that is going to give me a lot of performance. No, I can't really say that. So I might have to accelerate all of them to make any noteworthy difference. If they're all about the same runtime fraction, there's no way I can just choose one of those and make a di big delta. So that's a pretty strong argument for a, a low barrier scheme like OpenACC. If I plot the percentage of my code uh, that's written in various languages or for various purposes, you know, there, I have shown the parts of the code that are related to sort of the computational parts of the code. So there's half of the code is GUIs and things like this. But this, this pie chart's showing you the computational code. So there's uh, 20,000 lines of CUDA code in there, and that's, you know, basically 14% of the co core of the computation code is CUDA or intrinsics. Intrinsics are something you can use on CPUs that is uh, the next thing from writing assembly code or machine code. That is how you, you can do very, very highly optimized things on a CPU. Most of you probably don't want to do this. This is more or less what you're trying to convince the compiler to do for you. But I have enough need for this that for some stuff, that's the only way to make it fast. And so I have a bunch of that for CPU code. So you see there's a fair amount of CUDA, but look at all that blue that is still CPU, C++ code, there's a lot there. And so if I have to make all of that code fast, I can't really afford to go writing uh, 200,000 lines of code in CUDA. I love CUDA. Hey, don't get me wrong. But, you know, I got to sleep sometime. So that's a reason to look for things like directives and why, why we need directives to succeed because I'll never have the free time to do all of that. I'll have to find an easier easier way to do that. And so, uh, and with that, I'll take your questions. <laughs>